Thank you, everyone, for joining. My name is Norma Wattenpah, and I'm your host for today's Collaborative Connection Monthly. I'm also the co-producer of this series with ASAP. Um, and today's topic, we're very excited because this is one that I think has a lot of, uh, of uh, attention in today's uh, press and, and conversations about AI and how it's being used in the world of partnering. And AI has had a great potential to improve the way alliances are managed by automating tasks that are considered mundane, identifying risks and opportunities. But I think there's also the fear factor and risk of, does it make alliance relationships less human? And, or does it complement our human touch in partnering? So what we'd like to do, as we always do, is begin with a poll question to get a feel for the audience's uh, uh, experience with AI and, a, and stimulate some thought on the topic. So if you would answer this quick question, how are you currently leveraging AI in your strategic partnerships? Well, this is kind of a curious um, spread of responses. It looks like we have a few early adopters, 5% are using it extensively. Um, 44% who are using it occasionally, I would call experimenters and and not at all. So I hope the not at all are here to take advantage of Will's experience and perspective on how AI can be used to leverage partnering. So if we can move on, I uh, want to uh, introduce Will. Our speaker today is Will Yaffe, who is CEO and founder of Tidwit, an ecosystem platform for knowledge sharing and learning enablement that addresses the ecosystem challenge of many-to-many -many interconnections. Will is uniquely qualified to address our topic today, both as a technologist who uses AI and an ex expert in strategic partnerships and ecosystems, and I might add, a novelist about an AI love story. <laughs> so we usually begin with the fun fact about our speaker. So Will, can you tell us about this story? Sure. Thanks. Uh, thanks. Uh, first of all, uh, Norma, to you and uh, and ASAP for inviting me uh, to this uh, uh, to this webinar. Uh, yeah, um, you know that was uh, I, I I've, I've written several books. This one this one is the first novel I gave it. You know I gave it a try and and it's uh, uh, it is it's a love story. Uh, but you know being the technologist, the hopeless technologist, if you will. Um, uh, I, I decided to take on or tackle uh, the issue of AI and how uh, it, you know, how it will figure in just daily life, you know, um, in the future. So I didn't go too far into the future. It was more like, uh, uh, you know, the middle of this century uh, going forward. And uh, and I wanted to kind of tackle um, uh, the relationship between people and uh, how AI you know, kind of surrounds them. Uh, and so it, it was somewhat of a utopian uh, um, uh, book. And, um, and it's, um, you know, it's basically, um, uh, yeah, uh, I mean, uh, I don't know what else I can tell you about it, but it was fun writing it difficult sometimes because mm -hmm. I had to imagine a world that doesn't really exist just yet. But all the technology that I actually used or uh, mentioned in the book uh, is is technology that already exists. It's that's it's just the ubiquity of that technology that kind of over time changes. You know how we uh, apply ourselves and how we you know be it within personal relationships or business or otherwise. So yeah, that's it's the book is titled Fina and uh, and it was it was a fun ride, but it took me quite a quite a lot longer than I thought it would. <laughs> You always do. I I also posted the link in the uh, chat box if folks want to look that up on Amazon and and have a read. So, ladies and gentlemen, I ask you to uh, use the chat box for questions. We'll get to as many as we can. And also to uh, turn off your audio and video so we can have the best uh, quality on the video session as we talk to Will about more of his thoughts on AI. So, Will, I think we've got quite a mix uh, in the audience of people who are technologists and people who aren't. So 
if you could kind of set the stage and explain what is AI and what it's not, and what's the fuss about? Why why is this of interest? Yeah, uh, well, um, it's 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 an interesting question, and um, and I'll try to make it as brief as possible. Um, so AI, in my mind, is uh, is the next generation of computing that kind of takes um, the earlier generations that were focused more on automation uh, and maybe connectivity into the next realm, which is the realm of intelligence. And um, uh, basically uh, providing more and more utility from computing by adding that layer of intelligence. Uh, that's in a very general kind of definitional way. Um, there's there's three recognized forms of AI. There's, um, uh, without getting too technical, there's the narrow type of AI, sometimes also interchangeably called a machine language uh, or machine learning uh, rather than machine language. Um, the second one is a little bit more uh, general uh, AI. And the third is super AI. Um, the Let me start with the super AI. The super AI doesn't exist, uh, except in Hollywood. Uh, it's kind of uh, the Terminator type of AI where you have certain, you know, beings or certain machines that, you know, are super, uh, you know, uh, thoughtful beyond our own level of intelligence as humans. And uh, uh, that doesn't exist. And I don't think anybody in their right mind, even the advanced, uh, phys uh, you know, physicists think that it's going to exist in the next few decades. So that leaves us with the first two, uh, you know, forms of AI. You've got the narrow AI, which is which is somewhat algorithmic, if you will. So I'll give you some examples. Uh, that might be something like um, an an insurance company that might want to know whether or not a risk exists, and so they develop an algorithm to make uh, something, uh, you know, that allows. Uh, you know, the assessment of a risk based on certain rules and uh, and paradigms that, you know, they might have formed over a number of years. And so it's a very narrow type of uh, an application of intelligence um, that goes a little bit beyond what spreadsheets are capable of doing and into the realm of really kind of coming up with predictive analysis and uh, probabilities and, and all that kind of stuff. But it's still kind of specific. Other forms of of, of that kind of an AI uh, include uh, things like, for example, facial recognition, uh, stuff like that. So uh, those are called narrow types of AI. The the AI that you know is kind of fascinating a lot of people is uh, the general AI, which is that middle middle layer, and that's where, for example, OpenAI, which a lot of people now understand, and ChatGPT they work with, etc. Uh, is, is kind of starting to dabble with that general AI. And, and this is a type of AI or artificial intelligence that essentially almost emulates how we think uh, because it has been essentially exposed to a vast amount of data. Uh, the case of uh, ChatGPT and OpenAI specifically focuses uh, on language, which is why it's called language models. But there are others, uh, other forms of general AI. Um, general AI could be, for example, other examples could be teaching a car how to drive itself. Uh, now, you could kind of look at the driving element, and that was an interesting thing with Tesla, uh, when they were, you know, there was an internal debate, is this more of a machine learning where you kind of put in the algorithms uh, that the car needs to drive itself, or is it more of a general AI, which is how you know, humans drive because, you know, we, we, we are not fed any specific algorithm and then, you know, we learn to drive. We just use it, basically our senses, et cetera. And, you know, Elon Musk and, and those kinds of guys actually, or, or Elon Musk himself argued for the latter, which is the general AI, but it has proven to be way more difficult than I expected just because of the vast amount of possibilities uh, that they can, you know, that, that pop up. Um, and so, those are examples of the different kinds of an AI. But bottom line, it's computing uh, to the next, you know, to the next level, dri driving, you know, closer and closer towards intelligence. Uh, and um, yeah, but uh, I, I hope that was that wasn't too long of an answer for for quite a, an interesting and intriguing subject.
Well, I think it'd be interesting when you look at some of the applications, because I know the kind of the narrow AI that you spoke about, the machine learning type has been widely used in a lot of channel tech programs already, you know, like lead distribution or partner selection and those things where you're, where you're chomping through a lot of data. But how can a partner manager, you know, those of us who are managing strategic relationships, you know, how might we use it to create better partner experiences or better partnering outcomes? Well, great question. Uh, and really, we see applicability in both areas, as you well mentioned, the narrow AI applicability within the partner space, as well as the uh, some of the general stuff. So let me give an example of uh, on both sides. On the narrow side, we're seeing, for example, things being applied within the CRM space or PRM space, you know, partner relationship management, yeah. just to be able to do certain, <clears throat> um, uh, you know, functions that, you know, do them better. Uh, for example, if, um, you know, a partner manager um, or a VP of multiple partner managers wants to figure out how to prioritize their MDF, their marketing development funds, you know, how would they rank the partners? Is it just, you know, sticking the the the, the thumb up in the air and, and just, you know, continuing to do how things have been done for, for decades? Or is there a more scientific way of doing it? And um, with machine learning, what we find is they're able to do this uh, much more effectively uh, because they can design certain algorithms that allow them to see which partners uh, are performing or are likely to perform much more effectively. This is not general AI specifically. This is more based on specific data and algorithms that they can apply. And so it's a, it's a narrow application that partner managers, you know, uh, partner divisions, et cetera, could apply. Now, where, where it becomes really interesting is in the predictability element of it, because now there's more and more data that can flow back from partners. And so you could make, uh, you know, better decisions uh, just having that, you know, that kind of algorithm applied more often than you may have been maybe 10 or 20 years ago. So that's, that's kind of one example of narrow. On the more general side of AI, we're seeing a lot of uh, partner managers apply AI uh, to generate or regenerate uh, knowledge um, in order to disseminate that knowledge uh, to their partners much more frequently. Uh, one of the biggest challenges that partners face, uh, or partner managers, excuse me, face, is that technology and uh, is changing so rapidly that they just can't keep up. Uh, and so they don't want to just end up their functions as a message box. What they want to, um, what they want their job to be is more about business relationships. And so, what you know, this kind of more general AI, even if it's something as simple as um, you know, coming up with a with a PowerPoint presentation from a Word doc, right? I mean, that's something that you can actually throw in a Word doc, and it'll come up with a PowerPoint presentation. This can save hours of work. And what do you do with those hours of work? Well, you could dedicate to building a business relationship with those partners that otherwise you wouldn't have had time for. So we're seeing the use of general AI or that kind of use in order to you know, gain back some time and invest that time in business relationships. And so both, app both applications of narrow AI and general AI are things we are seeing in the marketplace. I think that's generally been an advice that at least I've had for clients is that you want to automate as much of the process as you can to leave time for relationship building for those things that are value creating. So I think in that sense, you know, AI can be used the same way. It, it hopefully uh -huh. your time for, for the human interaction. So uh, 100%. You know, about, I, I yeah, want to add just one thing here in parentheses. Because, Sorry, go ahead. I just wanted you to address that because I think there's some fear is that it will make partner relationships less human. Exactly. I mean, for a lot of us that, you know, um, when, you know, that, that have the white hair back, you know, dating back all the way to, uh, to Excel sheets and, you know, even Lotus and stuff like that. I mean, those kinds of technologies were brought in to make our job easier and help us do exactly this, which is focus on business relationships, et cetera. But when that in and of itself turns into a problem because now you're having to manage 20 or 30 different Excel sheets because you're working with so many different partners or so many different providers, then the automation that was supposed to make your job easier is now at a point where it's overwhelming. And so what AI is can help 
these partner uh, managers uh, do or alliance managers do is actually gain back some of that time, uh, automating some of these mundane tasks, even, even if they be computerized mundane tasks, uh, it'll allow them to gain some of that time to go back and invest that time in business relationships, 100%. Yeah, I remember spending weeks getting prepped for QBRs, and most of it was just trying to shred through spreadsheets. So, <laughs> yeah, I mean, we see now my life easier. <laughs> some partners spend hours and hours, well, actually, in the hundreds of hours, with the simple task of distributing something like a voucher. So, if you have a provider that is d delivering vouchers to its partner base, well, which partner should get how many vouchers and all that kind of stuff, right? You think that that function is fairly straightforward, but then multiply that by maybe 10 different providers and 100 different partners. And then that starts showing you that mm, that's actually, that takes, you know, tens, if not hundreds of hours of work, even even if it'd be on an, based on Excel sheets and, 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 you know, based, you know, kind of basic type technology. Um, so that is where AI can actually step in and say, well, actually, we can help you automate this process either through algorithms that can help in the distribution process, the narrow AI that I discussed, or even general AI, which allows, you know, such a distribution to happen with a little bit more intelligence. Well, in fact, that was kind of our next question. You kind of addressed it, but maybe you want to go deeper is that that one of the challenges of ecosystems is this many to many touch points and being able to manage those interactions and knowledge sharing in that context. And yeah, that's massive. That is massive because in a lot of, you know, um, it, it's interesting when we talk to a lot of the customers, one of their initial um, kind of, and I think it's the safety zone kind of um, way of thinking, which is like, you know, this is my way of doing things and um, and everyone just has to adapt, right? That's not how the world works, uh, particularly in partnerships, because every one of those different, what we call nodes or every one of those partnerships or partners has their way of doing things. And so today there's very few organizations that only work with one partner and most organizations work with many different partners. And so you're having to actually adapt your processes across many different partners. That is no easy task. And so this, this becomes a very big challenge, particularly when you're trying to process uh, you know, data or you're trying to apply certain processes. And if you try to do it the manual way, it's a nightmare for alliance managers and partner managers. Um, and here there's an interesting thing that, that we usually, we, we've seen, which is they don't know what they don't know. Meaning it's not that they are uh, set in their ways, but rather they don't know that they can reach levels of automation that actually can really alleviate a lot of this mundane kind of work. Uh, and that is, that is really interesting because once they do see kind of this many-to-many -many approach that allows them to offload through artificial intelligence and other automation technologies, uh, you know, that affect their ecosystem uh, positively, giving them back time uh, to really invest in business relationships, then they see the light. But before that, you know, a lot of these alliance managers and partner managers, you know, are inundated with requests that are fairly mundane um, and coming from many different organizations, all somewhat asking for the same thing but in their own way, because each partner has their own paradigm or their own way of doing things too. So this many-to-many -many is a hard problem to solve manually. Uh, yeah. But with AI and automation, it can definitely uh, you know, give back time, valuable time, to apply more on the business side of things and business development side of things. So I have a question from the chat, which is, uh, and I don't know if this is in your bailiwick, but what, I'm interested to know more on how AI is used in partner selection. Yeah, that's interesting. Well, there's, I think that's more on the machine learning side of things, which is algorithmic um, at, at this point. So you could, you could create algorithms. We're seeing, for example, some organizations creating algorithms that rank uh, certain partners based on certain criteria. Um, if you, for example, go into some partner programs, they'll have you fill out 
uh, some form of a questionnaire that, you know, a partner will fill out. And then, you know, that eventually gets sent into, you know, usually, usually the less developed um, uh, partner management systems will, uh, on the back end, they've just got a text and they'll just wrap that text and send it over to a, uh, to a partner recruiter. Uh, and then they kind of use, they either, you know, kind of go through it and uh, if they just want to grow their partner, they'll accept it. But if they have a little bit of a higher level criteria, they they may, they might use that in order to judge the worthiness of that partnership or not. So that's the manual way, right? And then there's the automated way of that information coming, feeding into a system that then gives you a specific type of a ranking. Um almost like a leaderboard kind of a thing, which is shows you a benchmark of this is where you want your partners to be or your partners to be, you know, your futuristic partner to be at. Uh, and if they cross that benchmark, then, you know, they can continue with the uh, with the process uh, of selection or uh, or they're rejected outright. So you could there you could use machine learning for that kind of a benchmarking process. Uh, ultimately, they have to get to a point where they do. They can meet a business, uh, a, 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 an alliance partner, uh, a recruiter, etc. But then, what you're doing essentially is you're filtering out uh, a lot of potential partners that are just not, uh, you know, don't meet that benchmark, saving you know time in in that selection uh, process. Uh, you're seeing that with partners. You're seeing that even with with regular hiring. Uh, so in some hiring, you go through two or three steps, again, they're trying to um, gauge uh, that, you know, uh, the, the, the partner or, or the person in that case uh, against the benchmark that they'd like to hire for, for people they want to hire. Um, in some cases, actually, it's using also some, um, uh, some AI to analyze like um, uh, the type of responses, the language used, facial, uh, some psychological elements to it. Not so. I haven't seen that on the partner side, but I have seen it on the on the HR side of things. Uh, so definitely, you could use the technology either algorithmically with narrow AI or a little bit more intelligently on general AI to to analyze and assess the future partnership. We have another question about concern about putting confidential information in something like Chat GPT in an open yeah. environment. That's a great question, actually, and that's something that's near and dear to us. Uh, I think one of the key topics uh, that is emerging now is um, uh, in, within AI is governance. It's called governance, and what governance is all about is, you know, general AI is a brain, right? That's been developed, and so they fed it a lot of information, be it legally or not, and then they developed the brain as a result of that. Uh, but computing brains are not so different from human brains or, or at least, you know, uh, in, in the regard of what you feed it, it'll, it'll, it'll basically base information, you know, uh, on it, unless you don't put any restrictions. Uh, and sometimes it'll invent stuff, hallucination and et cetera. Now there's a couple of problems here. I mentioned hallucination or imagining the responses. And there's some really interesting cases that 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 have come out in the news uh, on such hallucination. But there's also the privacy element, which is what the 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 person asking the question is. Uh, and there's been cases, for example, like Samsung uh, that wanted was so excited they put a bunch of data, uh, you know, uh, through um, you know uh, ChatGPT, and then they found out that some of it has gone had gone public, and so they locked it. So it became almost like a you know, they locked it down, shut down AI. Um, that became almost like a binary problem. You either open everything or you close or you close it down. Governance tries to actually of AI tries to come up with solutions that provide what we call walled gardens that protect the data and keep the knowledge on which you want to apply AI within the limited sphere that you want to apply it. Let me give you an example. If you have an organization such as, let's say, let's let's use two examples that everybody knows, Microsoft and Amazon, right? I mean, both of them, both organizations have a lot of data uh, just on their products, on technologies and all that kind of stuff. Well, if you're Microsoft, 
you'd like any questions on your AI to, 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 to provide answers on Microsoft's AI and vice versa with, with, with Amazon. But if, it's a, if, if you just put it out there, then whoever is asking the question, they might actually get an answer on AWS AI uh, or AWS solutions or products, right? And you don't want that. And so how do you wall off the information? How do you keep it current? How do you keep it, you know, um, within the realm of whatever is acceptable to you? And how do you keep it private? That is the, the what we call AI governance. And that is a, a very, very important element of ecosystems that are that are emerging because yeah. what ecosystems can do is they can wall off the data on which the brain applies, that AI brain can be applied. Kind of like, you know, if, if you're going to just, you know, anecdotally, like if you go to a, to a, uh, to, to a you know, uh, a heart doctor, right, um, a cardiologist, you want them to know just about cardiology. You don't want them to give you news about, you know, your local football team, right? I mean, okay, it would be nice if they did, but but really you want them to really know what, they, what they're talking about. The same thing with governance. You're applying knowledge or a brain on themes that you want these users. Uh, and that gives, you know, a whole host of benefits, among which, as mentioned, is uh, accuracy. Um, it, it, the data is sanitized. It could stay updated. Um, and uh, and it's private. And uh, so that's a thematic, which is essentially, again, AI governance and ecosystems can help deliver that uh, between partnerships and alliances in ways that no other solutions out there can, so, such as o OpenAI or ChatGPT or any other. So, well, I have two minutes for the last question. We've got a lot of activity going on in the chat with additional questions. So sure. I wonder if we can press upon you to maybe answer those offline. Um, sure. So the last question is, what should partner managers do now to prepare themselves to be more effective and productive and to leverage the capabilities of AI? Well, I think the, the, the first thing that uh, partner managers and alliance managers should do is educate themselves on the possibilities of what they can do with AI and what they may not be able to do with AI. So not to be swept away with you know, some of the fictions of what AI can do or maybe the future but really to use it for uh, you know, what it is, what it can deliver today. Uh, and I'd advise them to look at those two elements that I mentioned, the narrow AI, which is applying certain algorithms and things like choosing partners uh, or things like distribution of MDF and other functions like that, or general AI to save time on regener regenerative kind of content, knowledge creation, content dissemination, all that kind of stuff, all that could be used. So educate themselves on that. And use tools, start using tools, uh, you know, that will help, uh, you know, familiarize you even more with what AI can deliver for you and your, um, you know, and your, fun your job function. Okay, thank you. Thank you. We've got a lot, we covered a lot of ground and there's, of course, a lot more that can be covered on this yeah. topic. So I appreciate everyone who, who we had a very active chat bot, a chat discussion, by the way, and just questions and responses. So we'll share that with you. And hopefully we can get some answers out to some of these folks I couldn't address their questions in live time, uh, in bet, real time. Happy to Someone help. I'll answer questions. We need questions. another session. So <laughs> I'll leave that to the ASAP organizers. Maybe we do another roundtable. table.